Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to present here at this science plenary session this morning. Um, I'm going to be focusing on psychological effects of nicotine and smoking, particularly on three main areas, so cognitive performance, mood, and reward. And here the focus is on effects of nicotine and smoking in the kind of general population of um, the healthy population rather than distinct clinical subgroups, which um, Paul Newhouse covered very well last year. Thank you. These are my disclosures. And I'd like to start briefly by just giving um, an overview of the effects of nicotine at the receptor site. So nicotine binds to and activates the so-called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And these are receptors that are ordinarily activated by the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And the receptors are abundant throughout the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, which means that their activation can have quite diverse and, and widespread effects. So in the autonomic nervous system, the effects are stimulatory. Nicotine increases heart rate, blood pressure, and release of adrenaline from the adrenal glands, amongst other effects. And in the central nervous system, these receptors are, are found throughout the brain, for, across the cerebral cortex, in the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and the brainstem. And also, the receptors are found on the cell bodies and the nerve terminals of a number of other different neurotransmitter systems as well. So that means their activation can also cause the release of dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, and a number of other neurotransmitters. So it's not surprising then that activation of nicotine receptors has quite a widespread and diverse number of effects, including effects on arousal and attention, on anxiety, reward, learning, memory, conditioning, and also more basic effects through interactions with receptors at the brainstem level in terms of effects on nausea, respiration, and so on. Okay, so um, moving on, when we think about um, theories of nicotine administration through smoking, these can be divided into kind of two broad camps, really. So on the one hand, we have the positive reinforcement models. So those are the kind of theories that maintain that nicotine is having a direct beneficial effect and that this is what causes continued smoking. And it takes, you know, there's very different variations on this theory, but it basically maintains that nicotine offers direct positive effects. Um, some maintain that this is, is direct, others maintain that it's through manipulating levels of arousal. And we can take this a little bit further, um, and one variation is the self-medication models, which maintain that smokers use nicotine for correcting neuropsychiatric or neurocognitive deficits. So in those with schizophrenia or ADHD, or um, Alzheimer's disease, for example. But others take this a little bit further and suggest that so-called kind of normal smokers may be smoking to self-medicate for mild kind of neurocognitive or neuropsychiatric deficits. And then on the other hand, we have the, um, those who maintain that nicotine is having a negative reinforcing effect. So any effects of nicotine, any uh, positive effects of nicotine are just down to reversing um, withdrawal-induced deficits, deficits, in, so lower mood, lower cognition, and so on. So it's, it's not a direct effect, it's, it's correcting for a deficit associated with withdrawal. And some have very strong views on this. Um, Andy Parrott, for example, maintains that smokers feel tired and stressed without nicotine, and that smoking just normalizes, but does not actually directly enhance cortical arousal and emotional um, tension. So according to this model, then smoking directly causes stress and negative mood, and this might explain why when smokers quit, they report feeling um, less stressed and stress and depression improve. Now, of course, these models are not mutually exclusive, so nicotine may be having both um, direct reinforcing effects and negative reinforcing effects. And it may be the case that for some domains, nicotine is having a kind of a true performance enhancing effect, and yet for others, um, the effects are more closely tied to relieving withdrawal. So I'd like to turn now to look at that in, in a little bit more detail. 
So first of all, if we, if we ask smokers, well, why do you smoke? Um, why do you use nicotine? There are a number of re common reasons that are given. Um, so smokers actually maintain that there are some direct positive effects. It can improve concentration, helps relieve stress, can improve depression and anxiety, and so on. But whether these um, effects are genuinely beneficial or whether they're tied to relieving deficit effects associated with withdrawal is a little bit more complex. So I'd like to look at this in a bit more detail and go through what we know very quickly as I've only got 20 minutes. First of all, looking at cognitive performance. So cognitive functioning refers to a whole range of kind of information processing from basic reaction time and attention right through to executive functioning, planning, organizing, memory, and so on. So this is quite a, a broad term. And in fact, there are plenty of studies demonstrating that um, nicotine or smoking can improve performance on a range of cognitive tasks compared to smokers' performance when they have been abstinent for a number of hours. And David Warburton and colleagues have conducted a series of studies looking at cognitive performance um, associated with nicotine throughout the 70s and 80s, and um, usually using tests of sustained attention and vigilance. So the rapid visual information processing task was um, one example. And this is just one study the authors conducted a series of studies showing consistently that smokers perform better after smoking or receiving nicotine in some other form compared to when they had been abstinent for some hours. And the authors concluded that nicotine is acting as a cognitive enhancer through its actions in the cholinergic system, through boosting acetylcholine transmission through interactions with those nicotinic uh, receptors. However, it was unclear at that time whether the effects of nicotine were actually having a true performance enhancing effect or whether any effect that was seen was just correcting a, correcting a performance deficit associated with withdrawal because the comparison group was smokers in a state of, of abstinence. So more recently, studies have tried to more directly test this by either using smokers who are not in a, a state of withdrawal or by looking at non-smokers and giving nicotine to non-smokers. So here's just one um, example. There have been numbers, um, a number of different studies in this area. This was a study conducted by my group several years ago, looking at effects of nicotine on executive functioning. So it was a battery of tasks looking at planning, organization, creative thinking, and aspects of prospective memory. And we gave nicotine to both smokers and non-smokers in the form of nicotine gum, and we also had a placebo gum condition as well. On this graph here, the non-smokers are shown in blue, the smokers are shown in red, and the darker bars are nicotine, and the lighter colored bars are placebo. And our smokers were two hours abstinent, um, so the placebo condition for smokers is reflecting smokers' performance during a kind of mild withdrawal state. So if you look at the red bars, and you can consistently see that during the abstinence state, smokers' performance was consistently worse compared to all the other conditions. So we're showing that smokers' performance is worse when they haven't smoked. Um, and then this improves when they've had nicotine, if you look at the, the red colored bars. Now to try and really tap down into whether nicotine is having a direct enhancing effect, you can look at the blue bars in, in non-smokers, and here, for the action-based prospective memory, we see a significant improvement with nicotine, but not for any of the other constructs, and, and not overall. So on executive functioning, a little bit of evidence here that perhaps nicotine can improve cognitive performance, but more closely related to a, a reversal of withdrawal on, on, in this area. Now, in 2010, Heishman and colleagues um, conducted a review of the literature to look at any kind of true performance enhancement effects of nicotine. And um, they included only double-blind placebo-controlled studies that had either used smokers who were not in a withdrawal state or non-smokers given nicotine. And they had sufficient um, study numbers to be able to look at nine different domains of cognitive functioning. And they found significant effects of nicotine on six of these domains relating to reaction time, simple um, sustained attention, and some aspects of memory. 
And the authors concluded that these likely represent a true performance enhancement effect of nicotine because they were not confounded by reversal of withdrawal relief in smokers, as was the case for many, many of the earlier studies. <coughs> Okay, so whilst there is some evidence, therefore, that nicotine, acute, acute nicotine administration can have performance-enhancing effects on, on some areas of cognitive performance, on the other hand, um, it seems that chronic smoking is associated with decreased cognitive performance. There's evidence of this in middle age and for cognitive decline and perhaps increased risk of dementia in later life. And two, cross -section, two reviews of a number of cross-sectional studies have also consistently shown that smokers perform worse than non-smokers on a range of different cognitive um, functioning tests. Now, of course, the cross-sectional studies can't allow us to infer causality here. It may be that smoking causes worse performance, but it may be that smokers were different to non-smokers to begin with. The longitudinal studies start to allow us to uh, address that question of causality. And many of the studies did control for educational achievement or baseline IQ scores or baseline cognitive performance. But of course, even these longitudinal studies can't account for all possible um, sources of, um, of, of causality, of, of can't control for all possible compounds. Um, so overall, then, acute nicotine administration does seem to improve cognitive performance but chronic smoking, on the other hand, has been associated with, not necessarily caused by, but associated with worse, worse cognitive performance overall. I'd like to move on to looking at effects on mood and stress now. Um, smokers commonly report that smoking helps them to cope with low mood and stress. And if you look at a number of tobacco advertisements, you can see that tobacco companies portray this image that smoking is very relaxing. All these images show people looking very chilled out and having a, having a cigarette. However, studies comparing smokers and non-smokers consistently report that smokers report higher levels of stress than non-smokers. Is this because of a self-medication effect, perhaps? Are smokers using um, nicotine in the form of cigarette smoking to alleviate stress and low mood? Or could there be a causal factor here? Um, well, Andy Parrott is one proponent of the negative resource model who maintains that um, smoking actually causes worse mood and it just has a kind of, smoking has a restorative effect. This was a study um, of 25 non-smokers, 25 smokers who smoked as usual throughout the course of the day and 25 deprived smokers. And they were asked to report on their general uplifts, hassles, stresses and cognitive failures across the course of the day. And um, you, can con you can see here from the yellow bars, these were smokers who had abstained through the whole day, that they report fewer uplifts, more hassles, more stresses, and more cognitive failures. And that the smokers and the non-smokers didn't differ from one another. So the authors concluded that um, dependent smokers need regular hits of nicotine just to return to kind of feeling normal, that the smoking doesn't enhance mood and stress, but it's just reversing an effect that they maintain is actually caused by nicotine and smoking. So is this due to nicotine dependency? The, these findings don't exclude the possibility that the smokers had pre-existing differences to begin with, that they were more stressed and experienced fewer uplifts, and that may have predisposed them to smoking. So it can't... Um, specifically answer that question. If we look at depression, the, um, the results are quite similar here. Um, we um, typically find that depression is much more common amongst individuals that smoke, and smokers, um, uh, depressed smokers tend to smoke more. Amongst the clinically depressed, smoking rates are double that seen in the general population, and smokers find it, sm depressed smokers find it harder to quit. Um, and smokers are twice as likely than non-smokers to have suffered depression at some point in their lives. So again, the question arises, is this due to a self-medication effect, or is it possible that smoking actually exacerbates or, or causes depression either, even? 
So one way to help us to understand this is to look at the sequence of occurrence of symptoms of depression and smoking. Another way is to look at what happens to depressive symptoms when people quit smoking. So in relation to the sequencing event, there are a number of um, prospective studies. Um, Goodman and Caperton is one of these. So in just under 9,000 teenagers, depression was not an antecedent to heavy smokers, to heavy smoking in this population. But smokers who were not depressed at baseline were four times more likely to develop depression after one year. So this is suggestive, but, but not conclusive. Um, but there have also been non numerous longitudinal studies um, that have demonstrated that depressive symptoms do seem to improve when individuals quit smoking. And these are summarized nicely in a number of um, meta-analyses. So overall, the bulk of the evidence on, on mood, stress, and depression indicates that smoking doesn't seem to directly improve it, and it may even exacerbate negative mood. Okay, so finally, I wanted to um, look at reward. Um, cigarette companies often link smoking with other pleasurable activities. The Camel ad here actually states, moments seem to brighten up every time you light one up. So can smoking or can nicotine administration actually make other activities more rewarding or more pleasurable and smokers certainly seem to report that this is the case smoking is particularly enjoyable um, when you're socializing having alcohol eating and, and associated with many other pleasurable activities now there is plenty of evidence to support this notion from the preclinical literature <coughs> so rodent studies for example um, have demonstrated this phenomenon quite consistently. This is one example from Eric Donnie's lab, um, but there, there are numerous other examples. So in this study, um, rats can leave a press to um, receive a, a visual stimulus. This can be a light or some other cue. And it's been shown that rate, rates of lever pressing are consistently higher for the visual stimulus when it is accompanied with nicotine, as you can see in the top row there. And this compares to when nicotine is um, administered on its own or when the visual stimulus is presented alone. And actually, rates of responding with nicotine and the visual stimulus are more than the additive effect of just responding for the visual stimulus or responding for nicotine alone. So it seems to imply that nicotine is enhancing the reward value of another, of another stimulus. This is something that we've also looked at in smokers. I mean, these, these studies go back about 15 years or so now. We've developed um, a, a card sorting task, and, on, and, and it's simply you ask to sort cards as fast as possible according to a set rule, and on some trials a financial incentive is offered, and then we can look at participants' increase in speed of card sorting with reward compared to non-reward. Um, we've tested this with smokers, having nicotine in various different forms, smoking or nicotine lozenge. And we, we've consistently found a difference between smokers' performance when they've just smoked or had nicotine compared to when they haven't smoked for several hours. And in fact, if you look at the yellow bar here, it seems that abstinent smokers are showing a reduced responsiveness to reward. And this is reinstated um, to non-smoking kind of levels after smokers have had a cigarette. So slightly different to the studies with animals, here we seem to be showing a reversal of an abstinence-induced impairment. Um, Ken Perkins' lab have also been looking at this in, in human smokers. And Ken Perkins directly tried to um, mimic the the behavioral parameters of the animal studies to look at the cross-species generalizability of the nicotine enhancing effects on reward. And he did this by using an apple picker task. And on this task, participants can click on these trees to find apples, and they're offered a reward on a progressive ratio schedule of reinforcement. So this means that they're given rewards for an increasing number of apples found over time. And they can work on this task for as long as they want. And you can manipulate various different aspects of the task. So Ken Perkins has done a number of different studies. This is just the um, results from one such study. 
where participants performed the apple picker task under various conditions of reward and no reward. Um, and they performed it after smoking um, an ordinary nicotine cigarette and smoking a denicotinized cigarette. And the graphs show the nicotine-induced responding for reward after taking into account the responding with denicotinized smoking. So you can clearly see for music reward, this was when smokers were um, listened to clips of their favorite music, that responding was much greater compared to non-reward under the nicotine conditions. It wasn't so strong for other rewards such as um, financial reward or a negative reinforcer, getting rid of a, an aversive noise. But for music and for video clips, this, is, this has been consistently found in dependent smokers and also in non-dependent smokers. Uh, we're in the process of replicating this. It hasn't been replicated outside of Ken Perkins' lab, as far as I'm aware. But we're mimicking the apple picker task and looking at the effects of nicotine spray in non-smokers to see whether this um, enhancing effect of nicotine for responding for other reinforcers translates into non-smokers as well. So we'll, we should have the findings um, in the autumn for that. Okay, so that was a really quick um, <laughs> whiz through. So um, to conclude from those three main areas, Acute nicotine administration can yield performance enhancements on particular areas of cognitive performance. And that has been fairly well shown, not in all areas of cognitive performance, but particular areas of reaction time and attention and some aspects of memory. On the other hand, chronic smoking seems to be associated with overall poorer cognitive performance during middle age or later age. Now, the, whether there is a causal role of that still remains to be determined. There's some evidence pointing that way, but I think we still need um, definitive evidence on this. And whether that is a nicotine effect is, is unclear. It's more likely to be due to the general effects of smoking rather than nicotine specifically. In relation to stress and negative mood, smoking doesn't seem to improve stress and negative mood. It may even exacerbate um, negative mood and stress, as we see when people quit smoking, depressive symptoms and stress improves. Um, and whether any effect on stress and negative mood is due to nicotine or smoking is unclear, and it's very hard to unpick that from the studies that we have at the moment. And finally, there is some evidence that nicotine can enhance the reward value of other reinforcers. As we've seen, the animal evidence is very strong in this area and has certainly been demonstrated in smokers. Whether this extends to non-smokers um, is yet to be determined. So that's it from me. Thank you very much.